we will see later how the quantum electrodynamic Lagrangian um, arise by requiring uh, to have l uh, gauge invariants. But for now, let's get the interaction part of the QED Lagrangian by analogy with the Yukawa Lagrangian. In the Yukawa theory, the interaction between the fermions is mediated by the uh, scalar field. Uh, in QED, however, this scalar field has to be replaced by a vector field. However, this introduces a Lorentz index which we need to contract in order to get a scalar. This can be done by inserting the gamma matrix between psi bar and psi. Indeed, gamma is a 4x4 four four matrix, and uh, psi bar is like a line spinor, and psi is a column spinor, so the only possibility to get a number out of it is to insert the matrix in between. The Feynman rules are the same as usual. For the Yukawa theory, uh, we have three fields that for the interaction part of the Lagrangian. Therefore, we have three lines connected uh, by the vertex. The value of the vertex is minus ig, with g is a coupling constant. We have two fermionic lines because we have two fermionic fields, a psi bar and psi, so one with a narrow pointing toward the vertex and one with a narrow pointing out toward the vertex. And uh, for the bosonic field, we just draw it with a dashed line. For QED, the rules are uh, more or less the same, except that now we have to change uh, the bosonic line, the scalar bosonic line by a vector bosonic line, and also the value of the vertex changes in order to account for the gamma mu matrix. Of course, uh, the main difference between the QED and Yukawa theories is that uh, the mediator of the interaction in QED has a spin 1. As a result, it can change uh, the projection of the spin for the incoming and outgoing uh, fermions. Therefore, in QED, in addition to the usual four momentum, uh, we will associate to each fermionic line a spinor, which will tell us if the particle is, for instance, in spin up, spin down, or if the antiparticle is spin up or spin down. The incoming and outgoing fermionic lines are on mass shell. And because we consider incoming and outgoing particles with a well-defined energy momentum for vectors, it's easier to use the Dirac equation in momentum space. Positive frequency solution, noted u, uh, are for particles, and negative frequency, noted v, are for antiparticles. In both cases, the spinors are a function of the four momenta k and the spin s. These u's and v's are easily expressed in the rest frame, and in order to get uh, u of k or v of k, we can then boost uh, the spinors. These expressions are only valid in the Dirac representation, which uh, is a particular choice of the gamma matrices, and for which uh, the expression of the spinors are convenient uh, in the rest frame. Uh, the square root of m is just a normalization. To ensure that the amplitude gives us a number, we need to place the u, u bar, v and v bar in a particular uh, way around the vertices. The u's and v's are a column spinner, therefore they need to be on the right hand side of the gamma matrices. And similarly, the u bars and v bars are line spinners, so they need to be on the left hand side of gamma. Also, we get a u or a v whenever the arrow on the fermionic line points toward the vertex. And similarly, we get a u bar and a v bar when the arrow points outward the vertex. Remember also that time uh, runs from left to right, and therefore when uh, the arrows of the fermionic line run uh, in the same direction as time, uh, we have a particle which is described by u or by u bar. Uh, when they are opposites, uh, we have an antiparticle described by v and v bar. For example, we can apply these rules to this vertex.